first reading is from the book of the De Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, Now, Israel, hear the statutes and decrees which I am teaching you to observe, that you may live and may enter in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. In your observance of the commandments of the Lord your God, which I enjoin upon you, you shall not add to what I command you, nor subtract from it. Observe them carefully, for thus will you give evidence of your wisdom and intelligence to the nations, who will hear of all these statutes and say, This great nation is truly a wise and intelligent people. For what great nation is there that has God so close to it as the Lord our God is to us? whenever we call upon him. Or what great nation has statutes and decrees that are as just as this whole law, which I am setting before you today, the word of the Lord. From the letter of St. James. Dearest brothers and sisters, all good giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no alteration or shadow caused by change. He willed to give us birth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Humbly welcome the word that has been planted in you and is able to save your souls. Be doers of the words and not hearer, hearers only, deluding yourselves. 
Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their afflictions and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The word of the Lord. with some scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They observed that some of his disciples ate their meals with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees, and in fact all Jews, do not eat without carefully washing their hands, keeping the tradition of the elders. Now when coming from the marketplace, they do not eat without purifying themselves. And there are many other things that they have traditionally observed, the purification of cups and jugs and kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and scribes questioned him, Why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders, but instead eat a meal with unclean hands? He responded, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about your hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but with their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. You disregard God's commandment, but cling to human traditions. He summoned the crowd again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Nothing that enters one from outside can defile that person, but the things that come out from within are what defile. From within, people from their hearts come evil thoughts, unchastity, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, blasphemy, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from within, and they defile. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm going to speak today, of course, on the current crisis in the church. And I'm doing so to help you, it, my hope is, it will help you think through this issue. Because we're going to have a long time facing this issue as different jurisdictions begin issuing their reports. And so we're not, we're maybe at the end of the beginning of this issue now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Speak today about deceit and clericalism to help you uh, understand, in a way, the priest world. And I remember very distinctly when I joined the Diocese of Trenton after my first year of seminary, uh, I, it was uh, the custom then that you would report to the bishop and the bishop would send you to a summer assignment. And so I showed up and the um, bishop gave me the, the letter 
and the uh, director of vocations assured me that uh, the pastor was ready for me. I got myself to my assignment. The pastor looked shocked. And he said, I had no idea you were coming. And, uh, and he sort of hemmed and hawed. And having it all bothered me because in those days I didn't have my own car. I, I was, my parents were waiting for me to get the, the, the suitcase out of the car. And um, exasperated, he said, well, come on and we'll see what we can do. So I was there for a week. And uh, it was supposed to be six weeks. But there was a, a vacation Bible school that said, I can use it for this. Then you have to go home. But when you go home, you can't let your pastor can't see you, or you can't let your pastor know that you're there. Okay. Uh, so I went. Uh, so I went back at the time we, was, we were all supposed to report back, and uh, reported in to the vocation director. And he said, "By the way, did Father pay you anything?" I said, "No." Uh, he said, "Well, I'll see to it. You get something." That was 1961. I have still not gotten that check. <laughs> and. Every step of that way was an adventure in accounting deceit, purposeful or unpurposeful. And that deceit is part of the culture of the church. And it happened a little bit. That was just my first experience. It was not my last, anywhere near the last. Um, but even on a larger level, at the time of the Second Vatican Council, particularly having to do with the um, Constitution of the Church, which was my theory that I wanted to study. And um, all the bishops were requested to send in their ideas to the, what was at the time, the, the, uh, the Holy Office. Uh, and, um, and so they went and from all over the world, the boxes were building up of responses uh, to, to the uh, request from the Pope for information from the bi different diocesan bishops. It ended up that not one of those boxes was opened. And the Holy Office assured people that they had read everything and it went into their work in preparing this document when most of them had never, most of the boxes had never really been, had never actually been opened. And then, so that was the conservative piece of, of flummery. The liberal piece of flummery was this. When they were doing the Constitution on the, on the uh, sacred liturgy, there was a fellow by the name of Ugnini, and um, his job was to prepare that document, to, to lead the committee that would prepare that document. The committee was composed of bishops from all over the world. Well, it ended up, since he was in that position, he would tell the, the Pope uh, things that the, uh, saying that the committee said to do this, when in point of fact, uh, they didn't. The documents became available to us about uh, 10 years ago. And then he would go to the, to the congregation, to the, to the committee, and said, the Pope said this. And that way, he, he, and he was lying all the time. Or at least there was a, he must have said some truth. But uh, he, 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 he was the one who was managing the truth, and he was not. And everything he told the committee was not true, and everything he told the Pope was not true. So what I'm trying to say in a direct way, maybe in a direct way, is that this is built into church culture. And we need to understand that. I'll return briefly to this in a, in a moment or so. Clericalism. What I'm trying to do is to, when in the current battle, they're trying, well, what is the cause of this? Is the cause of this homosexuality? Is the cause of this uh, clericalism? And I'm going to stay away from the homosexuality thing because the report that came out from John Jay uh, said it wasn't homosexuality, he said it was clericalism. That may be open to revision, I don't know. 
I'm just trying to be uh, as accurate as I can in what I say. So, what's clericalism? On the priest side, I just think, uh, you know, I know a priest who is a clericalist to his fingertips. And so I just put two more or less recent things that he said that might help you gain an appreciation for this. When he brought up the subject of the, um, the scandal, he said, it's all about money, people want money. Spontaneous response, meant to close down the discussion, insensitive and unrealistic remark, indicative of a kind of closed, cramped mind, and a person who has chosen, consciously or unconsciously, to live in fantasy land. But immediate, definite, close the issue. That's one side, uh, that's one picture of a clerk. Same individual. Uh, he has to say, he doesn't, he has agreed, he has contracted to say mass at, another, at a different parish from his own. And um, he goes there and he finds that there's not a parking place reserved for him. And this infuriates him. Infuriates him so much that, you know, when I saw him two or three hours after the Mass was over, he was still steaming. And I, well, I'll show them, I just won't say Mass. I mean, out of contact with reality, out of contact with what is wrong. This guy is getting $175 for 40 minutes work. This guy is not a person who puts a whole lot of work into his preaching, or even to his reading of the scripture. In a, a live parish, where you have parking lots, you encourage the people to leave spaces for new people, for visitors, so that visitors don't have to go looking for a place they find that you don't want to put too many obstacles in the visitor's way, because you're hoping they will come back. And disconnected from reality. It's not about him, it's about the people you serve. And this simple little thing, he was reading as an assault on his identity. And so, this is, some priests think like this. Clericalism is not, is, is a infection that strikes the whole church. It's not just the priest. Clericalism is found in laity. Mentioned last week, mentioned again, two examples. The, um, someone spoke to me in the week, the week uh, two weeks ago, reporting that uh, a relative had been abused as a child. The abuse was such that I, uh, of a priest, and if he had to go to the hospital to be uh, helped, out, helped out with some things. And when he went home, uh, the mother who had come back to the house um, asked him what happened, and he said, a priest did this to me. And she said to him immediately, don't you ever say that again. Don't you ever say that again. I don't want to hear it. And when one goes to take a look at what's going on in the parish where it's believed there may have been abuse, um, one encourages people to keep it quiet, not so the church won't get embarrassed, but so that, particularly in a smaller parish, so that if it gets out, what will happen is some of the, uh, the person's own family, some of the, uh, some of the people who are their friends, 
and others will put pressure on them to shut up. And we don't want other people knowing about that. And in that way, uh, lay people cooperate in, uh, rather, share in this vice of clericalism. And so we need to understand that this is a, not simply a priest thing, this is a church thing. And you need to understand that when one lives in a culture or a subculture where things, well, what's said and what, is, what, what, what one hears and what one sees do not connect. The, um, the academic term for that is cognitive dissonance. I prefer the term BS. And clergy and people who are too front of, uh, too ident who are very identified with church live in a world of BS. And that is an insidious thing because what happens is you simply, you simply move out of your consciousness and your awareness some really dumb things and you will do really dumb things it, it controls to a, too much uh, to a too great an extent the way that what, what we see what we perceive. And we will do all sorts of outrageous things. Like one is needless lying. Lying seems like too strong word. BS seems a better word. But lying and BS have the same damaging effect on, on uh, thinking and perception and judgment. Just a little thing. There's no need uh, to lie about the Eucharist. That when people are saying, you know, receive under both species, to drink from the wine, from the cup, you, you will not get an infection. That's not a sustainable statement. And it's a needless statement to make. Uh, but the clerical mind will, will treat it, you know, with, without proper th uh, thoughtfulness. And you need to be aware of that. And it is a significant matter for it. the the the. Uh, Hemingway once said that the artist uh, has an automatic BS detector. And Catholics need that too. Um, we need not be We need to be properly critical and properly observant of our priests and what we say and what we do. You are now the face of the Catholic Church. We are disgraced. And things that you need to demand of us to properly resource you. And you should demand it. Is that we provide you with an understanding of what prayer really is. Because when we go to Mass, we're told what we have to do, what we have to say, and what we have to think. But we're not told how to pray through it. We're not provided opportunities to learn what prayer is. Not provided with enough opportunities uh, to understand 
how one grows as a Roman Catholic, what it means to stand in our tradition, how we encounter uh, the faith, which laity and clergy are supposed to embody as the signs of the world. And we need especially now to show what kind of difference we can make in the world. Because is the, play, is the world better because of our parish? Is the world better because of me? Is, what would happen if I died? What would happen if the parish died? Would we be missed? And because I realize I'm, I, this parish, I'm not so concerned about other parishes I am. What would we be missed? It's, it, it's, a, it's a good heuristic question. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.